I'm about to talk to you about something that I do not discuss a lot, uh, but it is pertaining to the ongoing challenges that we're having in our fundraiser. And someone brought up the black church and its impact on the black community and the manner in which uh, money flows through the black community and the inability of grassroots organizations to mobilize uh, financially in the black community. And so what I want to do is actually talk to you about that. Keep in mind that we are in the midst of a targeted fundraiser for the Black Men Lead Rite of Passage Initiative. And we are soliciting your financial support. The way that you can do that will be listed in the description box of this video. Please act accordingly. Now, uh, this is going to be disturbing for some people. This is going to upset some people. And those of you who know me know that I frankly don't care about upsetting people. Uh, my thing is I don't set out to intentionally attack or offend anyone, but I am a person who is committed to uh, disseminating what I believe to be the truth and defending that truth with great veracity. Uh, those of you who know me know that, who have known me for some time know that uh, I at one point held a high position in the church. Matter of fact, I hold two doctorate degrees, uh, I don't, which I don't talk a lot about, but I hold two doctorate degrees. One of the degrees I hold is in uh, theology uh, with a specified focus on health, uh, mental health and so forth, but in theology and the understanding of it. So I had to a master and understand system, systematic theology and how it functions and all of the other things that come along with it. Now, in the process of moving through that, there are some things that I discovered. So let's talk about my uh, relationship to the church, uh, where I am now, my faith in God, and how I believe the black church has impacted the black community. Specifically, we're talking about the black church and the black community. We're not putting Christianity on front street right now, so to speak. We're talking about the black church and the black community. Uh, so in the process of going through uh, seminary, first year, there's a course, uh, depending on what seminary you attend, uh, what uh, focus it is, whether it's uh, charismatic, you know, Pentecostal, Kojic, whatever, or it's more traditional uh, Dallas Theological Seminary uh, focused on, you know, uh, more traditional uh, doctrines and things of that nature. Well, regardless of what it is, that's going to be a course. It may be named different, but it's the course for me was canonicity. Canonicity is, canonicity is how we got the canon. The canon is the scripture as we see it, as we study it, and as we give it power. The canon is ultimately what most people refer to as the Bible. But canonicity is how the Bible came to be. We learn in canonicity that the Bible as it is presented in most Protestant uh, churches is 66 books. Uh, and in these 66 books, there are roughly about 40 plus authors. Uh, there are some books in question as to who the author is, especially the book of Hebrews. But we pretty much know who the other authors are. We believe we know who the other authors are. Now, these books are written over the course of roughly around 1,500 years. That's important because you need to understand that these books were not a conglomerate in the beginning. They were individual uh, writings by individuals focused on a specific situation. For instance, it's the 13 epistles uh, in the New Testament written by Paul were to specific churches uh, or to a specific purpose. In other words, the, Titus was written to Titus, 
the books that were uh, labeled Timothy were written to Timothy. Uh, the two uh, letters to Corinthians were actually written to the church in Corinth. And so they have specific issues dealing that those churches and those individuals were dealing with personally. And you have to understand that to really understand the dynamic of it. Now, again, we're not putting Christianity on Front Street. We're not putting Christianity under the microscope. This is not a discussion about the validity of Christianity. This is a discussion about the validity of theology and how it plays out in the black church and how black people are taught about God and about Christ. Okay, um, let's let's speed this up. So, in the in 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 the study of this, you begin to understand how all of this came to place. And I'm not going through all the details and all the things, uh, the country. But what you understand is, uh, real quickly, is that how the Bible came about. In reality, is far from what you've been taught and led in church to believe, and how it all was, you know, like this one big conglomerate move of God and all of this. You, you learn, okay, it's not that simple. Okay, so you so you have a question. So I went to uh, my uh, professor, and my professor is very open, very direct, very fr uh, forthcoming. Uh, the goal is truth with this person as well. Luckily because I could have went to somebody who was status quo and probably got a di different answer. <clears throat> but when I presented this person with my questions, my quest, um, the person's response was, you have come to a door in this journey that every person who attends seminary comes to. On the other side of that door is, is truth, but on the other side of that door is going to completely shake up your paradigm as far as it goes to how you're going to deal with God. How you're going to operate, how you're going to move and function. I can tell you that most people don't go through that door because it totally shakes up how they move and how they're going to be received and perceived when they return to the fold. I chose to go through the door. Needless to say, nothing has ever been the same since. Not going to get into all the details because we don't have that time here. Maybe in the future, maybe in a book. But what I can tell you is I immediately went back to the church. I'm excited, you know, and not immediately then, but as I went on and I did my own studies, I did my own research, I applied all of the hermeneutical principles, exegesis, exegetics, contextual study, all this stuff to try to get an understanding of what was being presented and how closely it uh, related to how it was actually being taught and what was really being said and, and everything like that. And there were some challenges I came up with. One was in the practice of tithing. And so I became aware of it. I studied it. I looked at it. And I looked at it on a number of different principles. I looked at it under uh, so many different things. And I found out there were some problems. Again, we don't have time to get into all the problems. What I can tell you is tithing as it is in the sense of tithing as it is in the sense of what's being presented in the black church and doctrinally the doctrine of tithing and giving giving versus tithing and all of these other things uh, there's a difference. Uh, some scriptures that are being used that, it, uh, that promote the traditional idea and thought processes along with tithing need to be revisited. So I learned that. That's one thing. And so there are these different things that I'm learning, and so I'm understanding that what is really there isn't how it's being presented, and that is it being presented in a way that benefits the people that you should care about, about the most. I agree. Everybody should be loved and cared about. Nobody should be disrespected inherently. But you treat people based on how they treat you. You handle them how true. But you take care of home first. So in the sense of that, you first take care of your family. Then you take care of your community. Then you take care of your race. Race is a construct. I get that. It's not real. It's a construct. It was created for a purpose. But people are grouped and dealt with and handled and live in life and are literally socialized within this construct. So you have to acknowledge it. So then after you get through with your home and your community, you deal with your people and your race. And so you deal with them. Then you move out. You make sure your home is taken care of first. It's real simple. It should be taught in any home regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of faith. You take care of home first and you move outward. Okay. There was a problem at home how things were being done in the community. There was millions and millions of dollars being collected from the black church 
year after year after year, month after month, Sunday after Sunday, but it wasn't being reflected in how the church was moving within the community. You saw the beautiful building, you saw all of the work that they were saying they were doing abroad, but the the little uh, socioeconomic reality within the community and the churches, especially those within the inner city, weren't changing. But money's being collected from the people within the city. It's even people who could not afford people who could not afford to give. And there's an issue with that and how it uh, literally connects, even if you're talking about tithing, how tithing was meant to be. If we understand and we really truly visit tithing, tithing was not something that was put upon the whole house of Israel or all 12 tribes. And matter of fact, even within tribes, not all tithe. Those who tithe are those who had herds, those who had uh, fields they plowed. It was, in other words, the wealthy. Matter of fact, the poor didn't tithe in Israel. The tithe, one third of the tithes were for the poor. They served the poor. They ensured that the poor had, because again, the poor will be amongst us always for a number of different reasons that we're not here to discuss. Okay, even in the book that is used most prevalently in churches to promote tithing, that book was not to Israel, it was to the priests, the Levites. That's Malachi. You know Malachi, the third chapter. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. How have you robbed me? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse. You go, you know the whole thing. Actually, if you go back and you look at Malachi, Malachi wasn't to Israel. It was to the priest. How do we know this? We go back, you can check the second chapter. In the second chapter, you find out that God is sending Malachi to chastise the priest because the priests have gotten out of line. They're not only mishandling the tithes, the money, the offerings, which weren't just money. They were herds. They were, they, it was everything. It was supposed to be for the feasts. It was supposed to be for the little Levitical practices of the priesthood. And it's supposed to be for the poor. They were being mishandled. But we get to it and we understand this because in two, the Malachi tells the priest that you come before the altar with tears and, and moaning, but I will not hear your prayers. Why? Because you have dealt treacherously with your wife, your wife from your youth, your wife by covenant, talking to priests. The ones who make the offerings, the ones who cast the prayers. Remember, the priests will go before God. This is before the cross, because the cross says, and you now go to God yourself, right? If we're talking Christianity, that, that's what it is. So we're talking about when the priests went before God for the whole nation. So again, there are some problems with that. Another problem you find with tithing is in the New Testament, where specifically, again, the apostle Paul, there's a problem, right? Why? Because Paul is established as the apostle to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? People who are not Jews. Jew, people who are G Gentiles would not know the laws. And see, when you talk about the laws, and, and everybody thinks the Ten Commandments, actually there were codices, numerous laws, over a hundred of laws, that had to be abided by. Jews knew them very well. Gentiles did not. Now, when Paul starts to talk about giving, Paul should, if, 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 if tithing was an obligation, then Paul would have been obligated to teach tithing specifically as an obligation. But what does Paul say when he's talking about giving? He says, you should not give out of compulsion or out of obligation. First, he says, you should give as it is purposed in your heart, because why? God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, it's not that just that you give, it's why you give and how you give and out of the spirit in which you give that has the power. And Paul taught this. And it's important that you understand this because Paul was teaching Gentiles. And if it, if it was necessary and obligatory, it would have been taught that you absolutely have to give 10%. Am I saying you shouldn't give? No, I'm saying that there was a purpose in the tithing. And that yes, tithing was there before the law, but it was also out of tradition. When you talk about uh, Abraham giving uh, a tenth of the spoils, uh, to, to, to uh, well, drawing a blank, but giving a tenth of the spoils, that was a tradition. If you went and you waged war, which he did to recover uh, his family and what had been taken from him, he waged war and uh, 
he won, he came back. It was customary if you waged war on someone else's territory and kingdom that you would give them a tenth of the spoils. Okay, so you have to understand this. This is why it's important to understand, and it, it, it's very rarely taught. Now, I'm not saying that that all black churches are not teaching right. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not actually p pitting, uh, picking out or pointing out anyone. What I'm saying, traditionally, in the black community, it has not been taught right, and it has not been executed right, and you can see it in the black community. One of the reasons that grassroots organizations that are not the church cannot go into the black community and actually mobilize financially in a way that will allow them to do the things in the community that are necessary is because the church has a, 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 a foothold on the community, generally speaking, and that any discretionary funds, and in many instances, non-discretionary funds that have been repurposed are now being flowing, that are flowing through the church. The problem is there are not credit unions set up. The church is not invested in business. The church is not, as in a general rule, not speaking of all, is not just in the education of the people in the community. It's not in investing in the overall empowerment of the people in the community. Uh, and that money is being ciphered out. Now, here's a problem that you have. You have to acknowledge the racial construct within the system to understand what's happening. You take a black church in a black community. They take up however much money they collect in the church on Sunday. They go to the bank on Monday and deposit it into a white bank. This white bank has inherent policies within it that restrict the distribution of those funds that will not be redistributed into the black community to help black aspiring business owners to increase uh, residential and commercial development for black owners and black homeowners for all of the other things that come along with that simultaneously giving funds to white investors to come into same said community and start the gentrification process by buying up and reestablishing and driving up property values that the current residents cannot afford to keep up with, ultimately driving them out through a form of what we call serial force displacement. Now, during this time, I went to the church and said, hey, look, we're in a great situation, but we got to be very careful. We are in an information age where the things that you've been able to share and do will not be easily uh, hidden. You're going to have to be open with people. You're going to tell them, hey, look, we've been doing this for years, but this is how it really should be done. And you're going to start doing it. But we can really, truly empower our people. We're in a position where we have literally, we can create our own credit unions. We can create our own situation. Anytime you can walk into a church and see an ATM machine so that you can pull money out and give it to the church. The church is in a position of power to empower the very people who are withdrawing that money and putting it into the church. The problem is the system isn't set up to do that. I have no problem with preachers being paid based on the manner in which they're impacting their parishioners, their followers, their members, the community in which they're operating their church. If I can look at your member base, and I don't mean just the well do I mean your member base, and it's flowing and it's growing and it's empowered and they are touching the people outside of the church and they are growing and they are empowered. I have no problem with what you drive and where you live because you're empowering other people to follow suit. I have a problem when your church is in a place or your church is pulling from people, whether it be in a television ministry, whether it be in a traditional ministry, and that money isn't being used to empower the people and people aren't being taught how to empower themselves. I have a problem if you're going into church church and you're being preached into an emotional frenzy and you're getting excited and you're talking about how awesome the pastor preached but you didn't go you don't have anything to go out into the week and fight with you don't have a different viewpoint of finances you don't have a different view viewpoint of the importance of owning your own you don't have a different viewpoint of what it means to be autonomous and operate within a unit you have not yet truly been unified and you are going back out and by tuesday all you're looking for is to get back to sunday so you can be preached into another emotional frenzy that gets you excited about what's happening but you don't know how to go out and make it happen that that's a problem for me so what I did is after going and and, and talking to a number of the uh, people that I had a whole lot of respect for people that are uh, notable names and said hey man this is what we're gonna have to do because this is what's happening and this is what's gonna happen over the next 10 or 15 years and this is what we need to do I said if we don't look at it we're going to lose a lot of people. There's going to be an exodus. There's going to be a mass exodus from the church. And I was told by several people 
that I was messing with their money and I needed to be careful. After checking that, the hood in me, and said, whatever, I realized that what I wanted to do was not going to be accepted within the grand scheme. Yes, there are some people out there that I've been able to work with that are pastors, that are awesome people that really truly are doing everything they can to help the people in the black community that are black pastors. They are out there because I met with them, I worked with them. But what I realized is in the total uh, construct, I was going to do better taking myself outside, going into the community and doing something on my own or with a total purpose and an idea of empowering the people in the community. What I didn't realize is the massive mental uh, aspect of them being anchored by churches. They're not trained to give. They're not programmed to give to anything but the church. But one of the things that, two things that happen in order to established my position and make it notable and put it on record, I wrote two papers, real short papers, the myth of tithe, the tithing myth and the state of the union of the church. And I called a spade a spade. And people say, you're telling people not to give to, no, I'm telling people that there's a purpose, that was a purpose when God made tithing a law, which was to the Israelites, first of all, it was for a purpose, and there were specific purposes named in that, and there were specific people who gave. In other words, the entire uh, nation of Israel or the tire, uh, tribes of Israel did not tithe. So then everybody in the church isn't required to tithe based off the same principle. If you're using the principles used at given, then you, you, you can't use the Old Testament, which is a different covenant, first of all, a different contract, a different covenant in the New Testament. And if you're going to transfer it, you've got to transfer it by principle. And when you transfer it by principle, then you've got to understand, well, if the poor were covered by tithes and didn't tithe, why are we asking poor people in the black community to give? There are pastors literally saying, hey, trust God uh, to cover you with your light bill. I've seen that myself. Well, you're asking people to forego their responsibilities to give to the church and you're not, now even that's dangerous, but even if you were saying, okay, I'm going to take what's hat and I'm going to go back and invest in the community. I'm going to create uh, a school. I'm going to create a credit union. I'm going to create a bank. I'm going to create something that will fund uh, betterment and empowerment within the community with what I get. Then, okay, but when there's nothing coming back but pray trust faith in god god's going to do something when those aren't the principles that's enriching you your enrichment isn't coming because you're praying and you're trusting god your enrichment is coming from your salary and the leverage that you're getting with other people because your church is moving money in ways that don't prevent benefit the community but benefit others who are benefiting you if we're going to talk the whole thing and talk the political game let's talk it for real i'm talking about what i've seen and what i know i'm not talking about anything my whole thing is I still think that the church is the most powerful and forceful uh, component within the black community. It's not being handled and run and managed correctly. There are some people out there doing some unbelievable jobs. Some people, and what I'm saying is there's a need for spiritual uh, elevation. There's a need for spiritual teaching. There is a need for that. We need to grow spiritually. We need to empower ourselves spiritually because that's the life force. But there's so much more in practical living that we're not teaching that we have the capacity to teach. We have the capacity to empower people. We have the capacity to properly socialize people. We are in a place and a situation where we can do exceptional and extraordinary things if we actually take the power of church. So my thing is, I'm not calling for uh, a total destruction of uh, churches. What I'm saying is, I'm calling them to the mat because what happens is, you're not doing it, and the way that the community is programmed, no one else can walk in and do it because the community will, the community will see the need. The community will literally sit up and say, you know what, uh, we need you. But the community will expect you to figure out how you're going to give it to them. Then turn right around and go to church on Sunday. Give it to the church knowing it's not coming back in any practical or pragmatic way. So when people ask me, can you see how the church has basically 
hamstrung the community and those who are trying to work in the community without itself being directly impactful and involved in the community. Absolutely. And again, if the shoe doesn't fit, you don't have to wear it. If the stone didn't hit you, there's no need to scream. I'm talking about all the things that I've observed personally within the church from within the situation, as well as what I've been able to observe and look at from outside the situation. This is not an attack on Christianity. This is not an attack on uh, anything except for the fact that we are not effective as a conglomerate universal black church. And we are inhibiting those who could go in and be effective because we have p positioned and programmed black people that you give to the church, but you scrutinize the hell out of everything else, no matter how effective or helpful or efficacious it could be in getting you to where you want to be. So again, if you're asking me, has the church played a role in the downfall and the, uh, the spiraling down of the black community directly and indirectly? Absolutely. It's, it's undeniable. It's unavoidable. I know a bunch of people are going to be mad at me, but my problem is if you're one of those people that are out there in your community and you're building, you're building. I'm not talking about for the cameras. I'm talking about you're literally building. You're building in the minds and the hearts and in the spirits of your people. You're building in the community. You are a direct uh, blockage to gentrification in your community because you have the force, you have the money, you have the, you have the leverage and the power. I've seen it done. Now, granted, granted, I've seen some of the pastors who have done that come under direct assault by the system. But that's a part of leadership. That's what, you, you want to be Christ-like. Christ came under assault because he was empowering the people outside of the system. So you can't say, well, man, if you go play that game, you go out there, them people are going to come for you. Yeah, they are going to come for you. Trust me, I know. But that's a part of being the leadership. You say you, you want to be Christ-like. You want to be looked at as one of the leaders within the community that says it's a follower of Christ. Well, Christ, the historic figure, as we see him, was just that, directly targeted because he was about the people and not the system. So again, here we are. What choices are you going to make? What are you going to do? See, here's the thing with me. I don't have a problem if the church is the one that makes it happen because then I, there's no need for me to go out there and do it. I just go back and plug into the churches that are doing it. I don't have to be a front street person. I don't have to have my name on anything. I know who I am at the very core of the, in the essence of my existence. I don't need to have my name on anything. I don't need for anybody to say that's the dude that did it. I just need it for it. I need for it to be done. So th that that's my thing. I would love to see the church because the church has everything in place to educate, to empower, to fund. We're not doing it though. And if you think I'm lying, go into the community and look. Research how much money goes into the black church every Sunday on a national level. And then go into the black communities from which that money is being taken and look at the state of the community. Draw your own conclusion and tell me that it's not possible for it to be different. Tell me it's not possible for it to be different. Tell me that you can't take that money instead of invest, I, 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 depositing it into a white institution, create an institution with the purpose of re-empowering or empowering the people who are literally putting the money into the coffers. Because what happens in truth is if you empower them and you give them the means by which to grow and expand and to become autonomous, more money comes into the coffers, more leverage, more power. But the problem is you can't be plugged into the system because the system is going to pull out and demand that you do it differently. Oh, this is that conversation nobody wants to have. And this is that conversation where I'm going to get phone calls and emails and some, some, some nasty little messages. And this is where I'm going to be called anti-Christ and you know, anti-faith, and I love, nobody loves God more than me. Nobody trusts God more than me. My entire life is built on living my life 
uh, in the way that I was designed, but I also recognize the God in me and the demands that that places on me. I, I'm not hopeless, I'm not helpless, I'm not gonna sit around and act as if there's nothing that can be done. I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna move and I'm gonna operate based on that and I'm gonna teach every person that I come in contact to do the same thing. If it, if it does not benefit you, you've gotta be careful about it. If it does not benefit the things that matter to you, why are you investing in it? because you've been trained to, you've been programmed to. If you can't pragmatically trace the benefit of something and you cannot connect to anything other than, man, I get that spiritual charge. If you, if, if you find yourself on Tuesday literally spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically beat up and your only thing is trying to get back to church on Sunday so you can get some more emotional charge. Emotional Emotions are not enduring. They don't have longevity. They don't have a long shelf life. You, you get it, and it, it, it's meant to put you in motion. It's meant to ignite something, to get you in motion to doing something. And it's what you're anchored in and doing that provides the longevity. It's the principles, the forces, the practices, the habits, and the behaviors that are going to determine what well you do. The emotions don't have the longevity to carry you. That's why by the time you get to Monday and Tuesday, you're already looking forward to uh, to Sunday. You know, so to the persons that ask me about how I believe, you know, do I, well, you didn't ask me how, you said how you felt the church was negatively impacting efforts of grassroots organizations in the community and did I believe uh, the same did I believe the same and I, I know for a fact that it's it's that way uh, it shouldn't be this hard to mobilize people it shouldn't be this hard to get people to give but people the only organizations that people are programmed to give to in the black community is the church uh, unfortunately we don't have enough of those churches giving back and that's the truth on that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here, get ready for this kickback and this pushback and all of that, but I'm good. Um, and uh, for those who are hell-bent on misunderstanding and misconstruing what I said, I'm going to leave that with you. I'm not even fitting to fight that, or fight that battle. Uh, I think anybody who's ever dealt with me knows my love for my people, knows my love for God, but they have to, con they have to be in, in, in the direct. If, if what I'm doing in the sense of dealing with God isn't benefiting me, my family, and those things I love, I have to reevaluate that relationship. So my relationship with God is based on how I'm faring in that relationship. And it should be in any relationship. If you're not faring well in the relationship, you still need to question the relationship. So when I started to question the relationship, I realized it wasn't the relationship with God, it was the relationship with the church. And on that note, you know, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here. I got a lot of things to do today. But on that note, I'm got look, for those who are serious about making change in the black community, uh, like I said at the beginning of this video, we are doing work in a number of different ways, but right now we're having a targeted fundraiser for Black Man Lead, which is a rite of passage initiative for young black males that extends from the age of four all the way to the age of 30 and constitutes socialization principles that prepare them for manhood, but also providing resources for mental health, resources for dealing with other emotional issues, and all of this comes together. And what it does is through uh, pragmatic and empirical evidence, we know that it reduces their proclivity to, uh, towards violence it reduces the dropout rate, which re reduces uh, the risk of them going to prison. It reduces their criminality. It prepares them to better move out into this world and be functional. We know that. That is a proven. We've proven that in our own work. There's a lot of pragmatic and empirical data out there that supports it, but we need to get money behind it. I'm challenging every person who wants to truly see a difference not just talk about it, not just whine about it, not just complain about it, but actually see a difference to get behind the work we're doing. We're going to keep pushing at the pace that we're able to push, but there's so much more that needs to be done. With the spikes in suicide attempts among young men, uh, with the increased level of violence, with 
uh, intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide on a spike and climb, which is already astronomically high. We are in a position to do something about it. The question is, are we going to sit around and just point fingers and talk about how horrible the situation is and never take action? Or are we going to actually invest in some things that have a change? For those of you who are gifted in different areas, skilled in different areas that can contribute to this, we need you as well. I'm calling on each and every one of you. Let's step up and let's make something happen. On that note, I'm out of here. station.